Good morning. My name is Philip Bain. I'm the Managing Director of Smart Cities Council. With me today, I have Monsieur Hanif, who's actually in the afternoon uh, out in Neom, Saudi Arabia. Um, Monsieur Hanif is the Executive Director of Technology and, and Digital for Neom. He uh, is responsible for the design and implementation of its fixed mobile satellite and subsea networks. In addition, he leads NEOM's initiatives on emerging technologies. This is the part I really like, Monsir. I really would love to dive into this, such as advanced robotics, space technologies, and human machine interfaces. So good morning, Monsir. Good afternoon. Yes, so what is NEOM? Well, I think, uh, I think images speak better than words. So what I'll start with is, uh, is one of our videos to show you what is NEOM. Neom is inspiring, motivating. Is a platform of dreamers and doers. We talk about Neom as an accelerator of human progress. It's a place where we can start again almost and make a very positive impact on the world and the environment. A place for dreamers and doers, as we say. Neom is the opportunity to develop something brand new. And so the opportunity to come in and start shaping the future is such an incredible opportunity. I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by some great minds and great talents. We are pioneers in a new space. This is a very new part of Saudi Arabia for the young generation. We've set our uh, standards very high. What we want to do uh, in Neum is change the idea of urban elements. We want to redefine them. Better humans, better society, interact with technology. We want this project to show the world that you can develop a, a world futuristic city, but also in harmony with nature. Neom is called the world's most ambitious project. So I don't think anyone can move down here without it saying it's not going to be a challenge. But I think for anyone that does come, it'll be a, such a rewarding experience. What they're defining me and my thing is a great opportunity to be the best we ever imagined or dreamed to be as a human. We will be working, I'm sure, day and night just to see this dream come true. Uh, I feel responsibility. We are building something for the future generations. We're not talking about pure sustainability, but we're actually talking about enhancing the environment and bringing water back to the surface in Neom. It's a place where we're going to reinvent uh, conservationism, where there's going to be exceptional livability. The journey of transforming the dream of Neom to reality is already on. Neom is the perfect destination where you are proactively involved in bringing health and well-being in every single part of your life. So when talking about Neom, you know, people have asked me, how do you describe Neom? Neom is the new future. Neom is the opportunity to develop something brand new, an accelerator of human progress. Thank you, Monsieur. That was really, as I, as I told you uh, off camera, the, the picture, the graphics, the beauty of the place is just amazing. It is, and in reality, it's, it's as amazing, uh, if not more. So how does this, so now that we've sort of seen what the, the place setting is, give us an idea of the purpose and the vision, and how does this fit into, you know, I'm familiar with Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, plans this year. It's... Uh, it's the president of the G20. So I know there's these long range plans for how this fits into the overall vision for the country. Yes, very much so. And Neom is pretty much a cornerstone of, of that vision for, for, the, for the kingdom, uh, which is underpinned by the 2030 vision. Uh, and we, you could consider us to be an engine towards that goal um, and an accelerator. So we're here to accelerate the future, to open, open the doors, orient, uh, the whole of the, the kingdom towards this new future by effectively pioneering new methods of doing things, new ways of living, new ways of actually seeing and building uh, the way we live uh, for now and the future. So what we're doing here is designed to actually break through the barriers that exist to that vision in, kingdom, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but also around the world and, and light the path, if you may. Light a path, I love that. And how does, what's the role of technology in digital? I mean, you, you're very um, much versed in this. 
And of course, this is something that the council pays attention to all around the world. Technology is fundamental really to that vision. And I think, uh, I think we're all ever more aware of that uh, after this, this very difficult year we're all experiencing with COVID. So um, apart from the, the fact that we want to be a completely sustainable uh, ecosystem of uh, environments here in Neom, uh, we also want to be a technologically advanced uh, ecosystem. And actually, if you think about it, we are the first, uh, first mega scale development that's being designed digitally first before the physical is actually present. So we have the digital design uh, proceeding at rapid um, pace, which allows us actually to communicate that vision much more. So that's the first thing. We are digitally first and we are in the digital era, which is very much confirmed by the acceleration to digital that the whole world has experienced following COVID. I would say we are the world's first um, post-COVID development ah. where, where the lessons that we are learning every day from COVID are being rapidly integrated into our design. And we consider ourselves to be the world's first digitally sustainable uh, uh, urban area where there are certain areas that are to a certain extent digital, others that are focusing on sustainability, but we are taking everything I've just said into an integrated plan to make sure that we are using digital technologies to accelerate and advance and bring sustainability to a level that you simply cannot do without digital technologies. And I'll, I'll have some examples for you, for you later on. I really like um, your approach. You know, we deal with a lot of cities. There's a lot of focus right now with digital twins, which is sort of a, you know, predictive analytics, but instead of um, starting with the physical and then trying to represent it with the digital, you actually start with the digital. So exactly. yeah, that's exactly. really interesting. So how does livability, I mean, we really focus on livability as one of the key components of a smart city. How does that fit in with, with what you're doing? Um, you know, the livability component for Neom. Yeah, livability is again, you know, together with sustainability, quality of life, it's essential uh, to, to the whole design of Neom, not just technology and digital, but everything in Neom. And I think once again, people have become, have, I think, a heightened awareness of livability and the quality of life. Perhaps by the fact that we've all been to varying extents and periods deprived of that quality of life this year. And we've all suffered from it. And we've also all kind of realized the simple things, the simple pleasures um, are really what life is all about. And you take that away and uh, it's not really the life any of us desire. So livability and making sure we protect that livability and enhance that livability is key. Um, and I think if you think about how technology can influence that, basically, I would, there's many, many ways it could, but I would just focus on, you know, uh, three simple things. One is time, second is space, and the third is security. So I would summarize, what does technology do? Technology employed in the right way um, should give you time for that livability. It should give you the space for that livability. And it should give you the security for your livability, to, for you to experience it. Um, and those are the three factors that we built into our, into our vision that we are implementing here. And all of those three together should allow us to really concentrate on the best aspects of the human spirit and uh, allowed us, uh, allow us to lead lives that are more creative, more, more fruitful, and of course, enjoyable. I love that time, space, and security. Um, now in previous conversations, yeah, exactly. We've said that, you know, smart cities as a sort of marketing term was started by IBM, what, uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, recently, IBM started talking about cognitive cities, and I know that that's something that you've been focusing on. What's the difference, and, and how, how do you take advantage of that difference? Absolutely, and we want to be a, a center of excellence for cognitive cities because while you know, some people may have begun 
to talk about it. I wasn't aware that IBM have, have started to talk about it, but we certainly have started to talk about it and we started to build it and design it and make it happen. Um, but there aren't any cognitive cities out there. There's a lot of smart and smarter cities out there. Uh, but we're clear smart cities are no longer smart enough. You know, it's not good enough to be smart. We need to be cognitive. So, but we have a clear vision of what that means. And, um, and basically, if you think of legacy cities, uh, legacy cities are based on passive infrastructure. Uh, and you know, that infrastructure may be very good and it may be very efficient at, at serving people's basic needs. But I don't think it's uh, good enough for the challenges we're facing now as, as, a, as, a, as a community, a global community. Um, the more advanced smart cities today are much, much more advanced from the passive. So they are now active, or we would say reactive. And they're getting close to up till now, the, 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 the aspiration of these cities was to be real-time reactive. Uh, and there are some cities that are getting there pretty well at the moment in terms of being reactive. But we've seen again from the impacts of everything that's happened today that being reactive is still not good enough. We need to be predictive. We need to be able to see the challenges that are coming. And that's a key aspect of how we see a cognitive city. A cognitive city should be able to protect you and enhance your lives by actually forecasting the events that, are, that may impact you and the society around you and have an almost uh, embracing envelope of protection and services that understand you. And that's where the cognitive aspect comes from. Cognition means understanding. So this is a learning city and a city that's designed with technology to really understand you and understand your needs as they may change in time and as they, you may move around. And that's why we need a really advanced infrastructure to do that. And the first thing is data as well. I mean, we talk a lot about smart city um, and big data, but the reality, I think, I hope you would agree with me, is that what we have is lots and lots of data, but most of it is dirty data. Uh, and by dirty data, I mean data that's not usable and it's not, it's not uh, being... Uh, it's not usable, it's not shareable, it's not, uh, exactly. you can't analyze it. Yeah, I mean, I sit in the room with people who talk about big data who've never done a big data project and don't understand, yes. So I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that one. <laughs> yeah. And that is, that, is, that is a fundamental aspect because, I mean, there's two issues here. One is obviously privacy, and privacy should be 100% choice and transparency, and we're not going to, we're not going to uh, lessen anybody's rights around privacy, but it should be an opt-in system where people understand the benefits they're getting and what use their data is getting to. However, the other side is, you know, as you said, um, big data doesn't really exist today in big useful data. Um, I've spent, you know, millions and millions in other projects just data cleansing, and that's why yeah. I call it dirty data. Right. Um, so our estimation is that on average, you only get about 1% of the total data that is actually used and ap applied in most practices. And that's one aspect. The other thing is we're still working in too many silos the energy department and the water department and the uh, infrastructure department, the mobility department, the communications department, uh, and I could go on and on and on. They simply are locked down under beneath their own firewalls and there's no interaction. They've got their own data models. And this is unfortunately the reality in, in, in many of today's even smart cities. So we, we would like to make sure that at least 90% of the data used, the data collected is used and analyzed. And we'd like a platform that unites all of that data to the service of the citizen and that there should be no silos. So only when, this is one of the advantages we have is that building a system from the ground up and having a common data model that we've already agreed up front. One of the first things we did when we started the tech and digital department is agree a common data model across all of those, uh, all of those sectors and all of those uh, utilities to make sure that they can all talk to each other and in a controlled and transparent way where the citizen still has his privacy rights uh, protected, they can be all employed to the service of the citizen. Yeah. So that's, that is a major, major uh, change to, compared to the way things are done today. Absolutely, and, and we have experience with that. We've dealt with legacy cities where real estate developers, some of the biggest in the world will say, oh yeah, we know how to build a smart building, but building a smart city with the legacy of use cases more than anything. Um, 
makes it really difficult. So how is how does um, 5G fit into this? I know that you have a real expertise in this area, so I'm fascinated about how that's going to make a difference. Well, <laughs> thanks, but uh, 5G is pretty new, you know. So that's, that's <laughs> what's 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 exciting about 5G is that nobody should ever classify themselves as an expert because it's evolving under our very eyes. But it is very exciting. And uh, you know we're lucky enough to have a have a, a network being built here already very quickly, but I think to get to the five G first, I think it's important to understand the three uh, key capabilities. So I mentioned the common platform, which is key, common data model, which is key, uh, and I think then you can summarize the the three core capabilities to building the foundation for that platform and that cognitive city in three ways. There's the connect, the compute, and the contextualize, and um, if, and that's how we're going to become the world's first cognitive city. But connect, obviously, the fundamental side is 5G. Uh, compute is having the capability to actually take all of that data and analyze it in a way that you get much more value out of it all together than you would from each of the individual data streams. Um, and then you've got the contextualize is really Basically, uh, Joseph often says, my, my boss, the head of sector, he says that it's no longer about content. Uh, it's no longer content that is king. It's the context that is king. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is no longer what the content was of what you, were, what, you, you know, what you were trying to access at a certain point. It was where you were, uh, what you were trying to achieve. Um, in, you know, were, you, were you moving? Were you somewhere else? And that can give you a lot more value in terms of uh, what you're trying to achieve today. Well, actually... Know, and I apologize for interrupting, but it goes back to the three things you were talking about, space, time, and security. That really affects context. Um, I know for a fact, I've been dealing with several technology providers that if the content is not secure, i.e. authenticated, then you don't really have the right context for it. Um, exactly. It's just, it's, it's fascinating how you've brought those two things together. That's, that's really cool. No, they're very much interlinked. Absolutely. And so when uh, we talk about 5G, that contributes because obviously, as you say, it's, it's contextualizing. Um, it actually giving you, I mean, it goes back to the big data piece too. I mean, one of the issues with yes. 5G is all the data you're going to get. Exactly. But I think, I mean, if we step back a little bit about 5G, and I'll go through some of the details here in a minute, but if we step back a little bit, uh, when people say, why, why is 5G the right platform to, uh, to achieve the ambitions that I've just announced and, and to, to have the city to be cognitive. Well, first of all, if you think of any other technology, of connectivity technology, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, uh, even fiber, there has never ever been a technology that has been designed from the beginning to cover the full scope of what's in a city, right. ever, ever. And I, that part I do know because I was involved very uh, closely in terms of the research and trying to understand what we should define 5G to be. So we said, hey, listen, if we're going to go and go do another technology, let's make it sure it covers everything and it's flexible. So 5G has been designed to cover all of the sectors of a city and all of the sectors of, an indus of all industries, all verticals. It's, it's that platform. So it's designed to be that platform. It's designed right. to be that cognitive platform. It's also designed to be highly secure much more secure than today's 4G networks, especially mm -hmm. the, the new standalone version that is coming. And as you mentioned, security is key to that, right? So it's got advantages that no other technology would be. So it's a natural choice for a platform of this type. The other thing is, I mentioned that we, you know, real time is no longer good enough, that we need to get to the predictive level. However, you can predict as much as you like. If you can't react after you've predicted, if you can't react to, to make actions or decisions or movements uh, extremely rapidly, uh, it's no use having a prediction because your, your, uh, uh, your action is too slow as a result of that prediction. So the, the, the ultra low latency that 5G brings in the release that's coming out uh, next year um, is gonna be fundamental because uh, I don't think you can actually be a, a truly end-to-end -end predictive system without having that really ultra low uh, latency, which allows you that speed of reaction, uh, which should be commensurate. So that's another another key key element. So I think putting all of that together, it's a natural choice. It is a natural choice. And so here we have some more details. You know that it's uh, it's got the capacity. So for future living, uh, in terms of experiencing things. Uh, 
uh, with such a quality that actually makes it pleasurable rather than actually being there, um, which we're all facing now with, with COVID. Uh, no other technology can handle that type of capacity that's required for those ultra vivid experiences. Um, it's been designed for, the, for, as I said already, ultra fast and ultra reliable uh, and, and also ultra secure. It's a key technology for the Internet of Things. Here, there's a lot of confusion where people think, okay, we need 5G to do IoT. No, you don't. You go, 4G is a fantastic technology for IoT, but 5G evolves that capability in the coming evolutions of 5G to the extent that it scales it up in a way that you can't do with, with 4G or, or any other technology in terms of the pure number of devices you can have per square kilometer. That's what really 5G does for IoT. Um, and I've mentioned safety, but of course, safety is essential to allow for that human machine interaction on a large scale that I'll be talking about in a minute. That is part of our vision because simply you cannot take robots out of the lab and have them interact with humans without having uh, the connectivity and the control to allow you <clears throat> to ensure that if anything goes wrong, you can uh, secure the system and the robots and the people around them very, very quickly. So it's really pivotal, pivotal to what we call the era of general purpose robotics and general purpose devices right, right. In, a, in a cognitive setting. I mean, one of the things I've seen um, with 5G coming on, and I've seen this anyway, is um, I had, I've had discussions with a number of sensor providers and it's, sensors are starting to become more commoditized. You know, prices are coming down, um, multiple uses. Um, and I think five, and it's partly, I think the, the effect of 5G, which is, hey, we need a sensor here, we need it there, we need it here, and they all can't cost a lot of money. Um, so we've, we've seen, especially in the water and electricity space, the idea that um, you, need, you, um, you, know, you need to bring the cost down of these sensors. Now, one of the things that really um, impressed me with our, in our previous discussions was this idea that Neom is a contributor to um, world sustainability and, and the idea that um, uh, we work with a lot of cities and um, one of the cities we're working with right now, Nashville, on urban flooding, and they are exactly at the cusp of that decision that you're talking about. They've been reactive for, you know, decades to urban flooding. And we had a session last week where they actually said, and we had about 20 other cities in attendance, and it was all about, we need to get ahead of this. We need to predict. Yeah. We need to figure out where uh, there may be neighborhoods now that aren't affected by flooding, but they will be affected 20 years from now. And we need to know that. So, one of the things I'm really fascinated is, is with how, um, as you become this cognitive center, um, you're gonna be able to support other developments around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, flooding is a, you know, that's, that's, that's a really key problem that everybody's facing. And uh, in my old life, when I was running the network for EE in the UK, um, flooding was a major issue in the UK. And we went through the, exactly that same question of uh, how can we, predict how the climate is going to change over the next 20 years and then how can we enhance our defenses and so yeah data is key and being able to analyze and process that data and then having the mechanisms to reconfigure your your city um, especially if sometimes you know the data may be wrong or you can have the best predicted predictive model in the world if the data is not reliable then in some cases you're going to get go down the wrong path so making sure that things are reconfigurable is absolutely key but to your question of you know how do we how can we help other cities so we really do want to help other cities and uh, our vocation i mean the very existence of neom has you know as, as i've mentioned at the beginning is as that um, entity that lights the path uh, and partially because we can because we have this uh, legacy free infrastructure but partially because it's part of our vocation i mean the, the initially it starts with the kingdom of saudi arabia and um, and uh, there's a number of mega cities, mega projects uh, here in, you can see on the, on, on the slide in the KSA. So first of all, you know, we believe that what we're doing in terms of the operating system the, that will run, that will be the brain of the cognitive city should be something that's universal and should be available to everybody. So we're designing it in a way that's not only future proof in terms of being uh, based on open technologies and open source, wherever that's feasible, um, but we think it's something that could be applied anywhere in the world. And the first areas, obviously, we'd like to, to support are the other mega projects 
in, in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, obviously, because they're the closest to us. And you can see actually there's a cluster of them quite quite close to Neom in the Northwest. And we're, we're in discussions with them to understand how we can help and how we can actually synergize. Uh, they all have their own special uh, specialities, but uh, I think that we are the only ones who are really focused on this uh, future technology aspect. But we've designed the system to be applicable anywhere in the world. So even though we are in the uh, situation where we can design the digital before the physical, uh, we need to design it in a way that it can be applied to any city that's got a mix of physical and digital, or even right. just physical. Right. So what we've done is we've, um, this is this is NEOS, the NEOM operating system. Uh, basically, the way we've designed this is obviously to serve NEOM's needs, but if you look at it as a platform, uh, it could be, it's designed in a way that, you know, if you've got a large or a smaller city with varying characteristics, it can be adapted and applied to a city if that's what you want to do. But it's also got, you could look at this as a, a kind of a Lego, Lego type of design cool. okay. where whether it's water, utilities, transport, et cetera, most cities will be in, in varying degrees of digitization today. So you might want to say, okay, well, I want to start with this piece or that piece. And therefore we've designed it in a way that you can easily apply which of those areas uh, are most uh, easy or fast for you to do because a legacy network, a legacy city will go in varying speeds depending on the status of digitalization in each area. Right. So it's a flexible model that we believe we can take the learnings from. I mean, NEOM should be a blueprint of the future. That's what we're really trying to build, the blueprint uh, of the ideal situation. And then it can be applied to the mega cities in, in uh, the mega projects in, in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or anywhere in the world, adaptable to the, the, the local system. But a key thing will be the data, the data model. So um, anybody you, who, sorry. Go on. Will you benefit also? Um, I mean, the one, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the one disadvantage with Neom right now is that since you're starting from scratch, I mean, predictive analytics, especially the machine learning component of it is based upon tremendous data sets. And um, I'm assuming you don't have, I mean, you may have natural types of data sets, but you probably don't have, you know, the urban types of data sets that one would get around traffic and, no. uh, and all that kind of stuff. So you also benefit by um, extending your tech. I mean, like in, you know, Africa, there are over 40 cities of a million people. There's some data for you. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I see this as hand in hand, so to speak, where um, you can provide the framework and the technology but sometimes the data is going to reside um, with your partners outside Absolutely. of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we are building a, a large scale hyper, hyper green and hyper, uh, hyperscale data center. Uh, but certainly the data can reside in the local country as well. It's not right. essential for it to be here. There are many techniques to, to still be able to do the analytics without actually uh, transferring right. the data. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, uh, absolutely. We, we, we can do a lot with modeling and synthetic data, but to, to really make it effective in the real world, you do need the real data. So we absolutely will also benefit from the learning, the NEOS, uh, uh, let's say, apprentice apprenticeship uh, through co collaboration. So we're very open to discuss with any cities who want to do that with us. Um, but yes, the key thing then is to create that, show that, demonstrate that value that you get from that data. I would only suggest that if there are cities who haven't yet launched their, their, their haven't really advanced on that path towards uh, the cognitive city, agreeing a data model is really key. Right. And we're more than happy to to share what we've uh, come up with as a data model, which is all based on sta and global standards. So it's something that anybody could adopt. Um, and actually, if you do that as well, then it makes it even easier to simply plug and play aspects of NEOS. Right. However, if you if you have any other data model, it's still possible. You just need to plug in some some of our software developers can go through the details, but just plug in the adapters for the various different data right. models. So we're not what we're not doing is doing our own bespoke data model here that's only applicable here and ignoring global standards that would that that would belie our ambition to help Absolutely. other cities right. so it has to be well, based on and, and you mentioned it earlier open standards and interoperability is the key to um smart yeah. and cognitive sharing. cities yeah uh, yep. and sharing and and um, the fact that you've built your model on that um your infrastructure on that makes it easier to um to share data and to provide value so uh, you really have played out the vision in that sense yeah 
Yeah. Well, and in terms of sustainability, I mean, certainly we mentioned, you know, how the, 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 on a very high level, the time, the space, the security. But, I, you know, as I said, we are the post-COVID uh, development uh, on a large scale, the world's first. And uh, some of the things that we, you know, we've embedded into the design over the last year, for example, I'll give you some examples if that's okay. I mean, for example, we look at utilities in terms of water, telecoms, energy, et cetera, uh, wastewater. Um, but we see all of that as you know, veins in that arteries of that sing single cognitive system. Now, if you, if you look at COVID and the way that sewage samples from two years ago now are being right, used to, to right. check. Yeah. So what we want to plan into our uh, ecosystem is that the sewage, the wastewater facility is, in, is a part of a clinical network, which we see as a key part of the other utilities, which means that you can actually do continuously these measurements to, to check and predict for what's coming down down the road and you don't have to go out and look for samples from 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 backwards and actually use that to understand the status and wherever possible having you know we're going to try and design clinical networks in the urban infrastructure where in the case of a, of a, of a virus um, an epidemic uh, or a pandemic that we understand how we can use that clinical network embedded in the buildings in the urban infrastructure and the sewage plants to actually make it quicker and easier to get samples for people in the safety of their homes and to transmit those samples safely to a central analysis right. point. So that's right. one example. The other one is configurable infrastructure. So if you look at today, and I don't know how many cities are going there, drawing lines on the floor, draw lines on the walls, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd like to take, we'd like to make sure that um, that first of all, we go from digital signage to virtual signage, which means that uh, in an urban environment, uh, the city will automatically be able to project uh, spaces, distances uh, for social distancing dynamically, and they can change those without any physical changes uh, every hour if they want to. You know, So that's something that we feel is going to be part of the new modern world post COVID. The other thing is reconfigurable furniture, you know, urban furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, depending on the situation and depending on the, the level of resiliency you want to build into that, uh, many cities are having to rearrange public spaces. Uh, just look at, for example, Manchester United yesterday, uh, Old Trafford. <laughs> right. I'm a big, I'm a big Man United fan, so I'll okay, say, cool, I get it. So I'm, a, I'm a big football fan, uh, soccer. So I totally appreciate what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. See, so just for those who may not know, uh, Old Trafford has got a capacity of I don't know, 80,000 80, or so. Eighty thousand, yeah. Oh yeah, or higher, I'm not sure, but uh, they reconfigured it to fit twenty five thousand, but socially distanced. Right. Uh, but they had to do that physically, and uh, the government still doesn't agree with them in the current situation. But just to give you an idea of what it means to have a have a physically reconfigurable infrastructure, which means you can simply do that at a flick of a switch or automatically, depending on the situation, you know. So I think all of that. And then there's the the buildings themselves need to be reconfigurable, for to make the best use of sustainability for the environment. But uh, they also need to be reconfigurable from the inside so that now all of us are working from home to, to certain levels. So uh, we should design the buildings using modern construction techniques that are in such a way that people can easily reconfigure a single space for multiple uses in a way that we've never had to do before. So that's really extending. Again, you're, you're starting with digital and going to physical. And I think that's another represent use case along that, those lines. But then you have to have modular types of approaches. And by the way, why didn't Man U beat Chelsea last weekend? <laughs> I wish I knew. That was a shame. But we did win yesterday. That's a, yeah. No, you that was did. a great, great match yesterday. Yeah, I don't like Chelsea, so I was just like, nah, come on. Who likes Chelsea? I shouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So, um, so moving on. Um, we talked about this earlier. Um, we've worked with a lot of legacy cities and we've seen this really inability to, um, to sort of translate. Um, you know, they can build one smart building within an old city, but then how do they move it? And, and what's the advantage that you're gonna be able to bring with NEOS and NEOM to, to the whole idea? Because I mean, what we really have throughout the world are legacy cities. Um, you know, what, 98, 99% of all the cities in the world are, have been around for hundreds of years. Yeah, and I think we touched on this a bit earlier. And, uh, uh, and basically, first thing is, is a blueprint uh, of, let's say, the ideal situation. If you were to design something from scratch, what would you do? So, you know, we, we, we aspire to be that blueprint uh, that people can come and visit and learn from, and we're happy to share as well. And secondly, you have that platform that's a tool for everybody 
and it's got the building blocks as Lego type of functionalities that people can can use uh, as they see fit. So, you know, even if you're not, if you are a legacy city to varying degrees, there should be something there for everybody. And I think it just helps uh, in any case, you know, if, you, if you're in a situation where it's not quite clear w what direction to take, seeing, seeing some destinations already planned out would, is very helpful for you to, to find your path to that destination. Right. And, and, and I think what we'll also probably need to do is working with the other cities is kind of have playbooks where we can probably, you know, I think it'd be good to work with the Smart Cities Council on that, to design the playbooks depending on varying degrees of legacy infrastructure in a city in various sectors, and then, uh, you know, uh, design a playbook of simple steps that you can take to get to becoming fully digital. It's, you're, you're blowing me away because we actually built a platform 18 months ago to do that. It's an online collaborative planning platform called Smart Cities Activator, which is exactly intended to give cities playbooks. Because that's, right. that's, the, that's the big problem is they just can't, you know, you, you teach them some of the technology, but they don't have the monies or budgets and, and they need that expertise that can be provided by Neom, but then they have to take that expertise and convert it to action. And that's exactly. the hard part. That's the real Well, that's very part. impressive. I think that's, yeah. great. that's a great approach to take. So, um, so we have the Cognitive Foundation and, um, and you're going to generate a lot of data. And we talked about how you can use data from, um, from other, from partners, from other parts of the world, which I think is really fascinating. So then the question is, um, what, you know, what's your new approach? I mean, we talked about technology, though we have to admit at the beginning, we talked about sustainability. So how are you going to bring that all together? Yeah, yeah it's not all about uh, technology. Technology is a fundamental aspect to enable that. We talked about time, space, and security, and I think uh, I think the way the whole of the urban infrastructure is being developed is also with those fundamental principles in mind. So sustainability is absolutely key. Um, first of all, all of the energy that's going to be used in Neom is going to be green. So either solar, um, wind, or hydrogen. Uh, we are experimenting with new methods of generating uh, water as well from desalination uh, without without throwing the salt uh, or the brine that's generated from desalination back into the sea as is mostly done so we'd like to to find uh, new methods of treating that brine and using it as a cycle so recycling and the circular economy is very key to everything we do so if you take that example for example we're trying to we're trying to use the excess heat that's generated uh, when we do that uh, desalination using solar power, we're trying to use the excess heat that's generated to transform the brine or to feed into the, feed into other elements that we can, uh, well, we can transform the brine from that. Conversely, we can also use the heat that's generated from the data centers to, to also uh, uh, process the brine. So it's circular economy and making sure that we're working in a coordinated fashion to make the most out of every resource we have is, is key. And if you look at hydrogen, for example, we, we aim to be the world's, uh, one of the world's leading producers of green hydrogen in the world. That's hydrogen that is produced through these, the type of methods I just mentioned, which are purely through renewable energy. Um, and basically, if you look at the telecoms networks, for example, or any other infrastructure that's gonna be running here, then you're off to a, a pretty good starting point because even if you're taking it from the, the, uh, the national grid here, that grid is already green, completely green, 100%. Right, right. So, but we want to go beyond that, and we're looking at things like using hydrogen directly as a, instead of a battery backup, instead of diesel generators, for example, from mobile base stations. We're looking at whether we could actually pipe that hydrogen uh, into rather than having it topped up uh, in reservoirs. So, that's a key part of it. Um, so, the we think that in terms of sustainability. Uh, we are in a position that's going to allow us to experiment and bring these technologies even further. The other thing is, you know, the livability is the way that the, the way the, uh, the cities are being uh, designed. And I don't think we've released all the details of this yet, but I can tell you it is absolutely mind blowing. Uh, we're only going to be using a tiny percentage of the actual territory. I mean, the territory is the size of Belgium. Uh -huh. So, okay. and when we mean conserved here, we mean absolutely untouched. You will not untouched. see, yeah. you will not see infrastructure. You will not see overhead pylons. And a big challenge for me, very big challenge for me, is you won't see any telecoms towers 
outside of that four <laughs> percent. So I have a I have a big challenge on my. I've been, I've been given the task of designing 100% 5G coverage in all of that, but we're going to design it on demand, having coverage on demand through through innovative drone-based systems, so that ah, you get the you get okay. the coverage when you need it, where you need it. We don't need to leave a tower there forever okay. in the remote areas, and that's much more sustainable. So. So there's a huge part of conserving the beautiful, you mentioned how beautiful the scenery is here as well. We really want to conserve that, but really 100% conservation in those areas. Right. Uh, and then the final thing I would say is in terms of transport, you know, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, passenger pods, passenger transport, it's all, the whole city has been designed to minimize um, the need to take any transport, first of all, and any transport we will take is highly efficient and, and, gotcha. and green. Okay. Okay. And you should be able to walk from anywhere to anywhere. And then, the city, the main cities have been designed in a very modular way, which means that in these modular city blocks, you can walk from anywhere to anywhere within three or four minutes. Um, mm. And that you can, you, you can reuse the resources within that modular block. So the circular economy is being applied locally. Right. And we're applying okay. some, some blockchain technologies to make sure we can track and, and reward people who do use the resources locally rather than even on the extended areas within NEOM. Mm. So... So uh, you can see there's a lot more than just the pure technology, even though technology has a small role, at least to play in everything. Well, technology is serving a purpose here. It's not technology for technology's sake. It's actually to enhance the lives of the people living there. And um, it's, exactly. and it'll, it'll exactly. enhance the lives of people living elsewhere, exactly. which is important. What's the, what's the path of development? I mean, you know, I've been hearing about Neom now for about two or three years. Um, when would it actually uh, be open for people to, you know, visit or to live there? What, what's the projected date? Well, there's already uh, quite a few people living here. I'm here right now. I'm I was going to say, my, my last question was going to be, you're actually a pioneer, right? Besides yeah. all this digital pioneering we're talking about, you actually live in Neom. So I, I, I found that to be fascinating when I heard that. And, uh, and I was going to say, oh, here's a true pioneer. He's, he's at the cutting edge, both... <laughs> I am, and there's several hundred of us who are here, and we're here every single day, um, working really hard, uh, but enjoying that. I'm a pioneer. I'm one of those dreamers and believers and doers, so I'm delighted to be given this opportunity to participate. Um, but yeah, the, the population who is not working on the project obviously is very low. So um, so at, uh, the plans are, actually, if you want to come and visit Neom uh, over the next year, it's possible to come and visit. Oh, is you know, it? It, just, okay. just, okay, it just cool. it just takes a bit of arranging, right. but obviously there's a lot of construction work going on. Sure. So, uh, um, and in terms of the overall project plan, so the aim is to have one million residents by 2030. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. The current uh, population of the overall region is, you know, I think less than 60,000. Sure. So, so it's a it's a huge uh, huge influx, uh, but the project itself will never end. I mean, it's that's what I love about about the project is that they've, they've made it very clear, this is something that's gonna keep evolving forever. Uh, but the 2030 is the, the, let's say, the goal to get to 1 million, and that's gonna sure, be significant. Sure. Our first main milestone in terms of development will be 2025, when we'll have a good part of the major deliverables oh, already okay. done. Okay. In terms of, you know, apart from coming and visiting and seeing what we're, build, what we're starting to build and seeing the digital side of NEO, uh, we, in the next year, in the next two to three years, there will be elements that will be built earlier. So there will be a range of hotels. There will be experiences okay. that you can do. So there will be things, there will be tourist experiences as well. So gradually that will be coming up as soft launches over the next two to three years. That's amazing. I mean, that's, that's really enlightening and amazing. I, um, and I appreciate, yeah, the pioneering aspect of it, but we can close. You, you actually came to exactly where I sort of have a picture of what a smarter cognitive city is, and you said it's a journey. Um, it, it never really ends. If you're imaginative, creative, um, and I, this is one of the things I've learned, and I sense it just in the tone of your voice, actually doing this is the fun part. <laughs> exactly, it's the journey. Yeah. It's the Absolutely. journey, yeah. Yeah, I, I envy you that. I envy you that. I have to say, because building a new world and and uh, being a pioneer as you are, is really um, it's heartwarming. Well, it's certainly, I pinch myself as well to 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 realize how lucky I am to be here. And we are reaching out to other you know dreamers and pioneers and believers and doers who need to do and dream at the same time. We are increasing uh, our workforce. Uh, there are more people joining us. There's plenty more opportunities. 
and you're right. I mean, that's what attracted me is simply that possibility to to realize, you know, what we've all dreamt of. And it's, it's what's motivated most people who are here, whether it's the guys from Water who always dreamt of the perfect designing and building that perfect system. <laughs> they've probably designed it a hundred times in other projects. They've never been able to build it and they're building right. it here. Right. And the same for energy. And for me as well, I mean, I've had, I've had a really fantastic professional, you know, opportunities to do really interesting stuff. But I really, I mean, when I was a kid, I never read a book twice. I just couldn't because I knew I knew it was going to end. Right. And I'm really looking, I, I hate to repeat myself. And I like challenges that nobody solved. That's why I'm here, because we've got a chance to try and solve them where you wouldn't get necessarily right. anywhere else. Yeah, you never want to get to that last page. Yeah, you always, you want to be a page turner. It's, exactly. it's, it's funny, you and I, you're using metaphors and analogies that totally relate to me. Um, so I really appreciate that. So Monsieur and Neo, and I will say Neos, because I think that's probably the engine that's going to drive all of this. I really appreciate your time today. And any last thoughts before we, uh, we sign off? No, I would say just what, I, what I've already said. I mean, if you have similar dreams and if you want to realize them and build them, um, come and join us. Uh, if you want to um, share in the experience and apply these to your own dreams in your own part of the world, come and talk to us. And, you know, I'd be very happy to interface through, through Philip and the Smart Cities Council. Uh, we're just beginning that journey now. So very happy for you to, to join us on, on that. And, uh, and yeah, I think there's a, you know, despite the, the gloom of the current situation in 2020, there's a lot to look forward to. There absolutely is. And, and one of the reasons I really appreciate this time too is that um, we have this vision sort of of cities helping cities at the council and it's you build one city right and you build the rest of the world right. And so I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. With that, thank you for your time and thank you for I the hope you have a nice afternoon. Take care. Yeah, likewise. Thank you very much. Bye now.